of Pushing Cardboard. I'm Grant Menneberg, and uh, this is episode four. Today we'll be talking about what it's like to come back to advanced squad leader after a 20-year break away from the World War II tactical behemoth. Uh, what it was like back in the 90s and what's new now that I'm looking at it afresh. And then we'll have a look at Caesar, Rome vs. Gaul, a fairly new game from Mark Simonich, uh, published by GMT. Uh, also note that uh, episode 5 will be a special interview episode with Carl Pardee, uh, designer of Absolute War uh, and uh, the No Retreat series, and that'll be available very soon. Uh, I've got it recorded, just have to uh, finish editing it, and it'll be good to go. So uh, look for that uh, soon if you're interested in that game or that designer. Uh, before we get to uh, the big sections, uh, I'd like to talk about what I've been playing Um in this recent uh, month and over Christmas, really, it's been all vassal PBEM. There's been uh, no face-to-face, -face, no, no, uh, no live vassal even, um, and I haven't even really had much time to get anything out on the table and just uh, teach myself something new. It's been quite busy, but uh, on the vassal front, uh, the PBEM front, it's been um, good uh, as always. Plenty of commands and colors. I've got uh, games of Ancients, Napoleon, Tricorn, and Samurai all going. Um, lots of ASL. Two scenarios of ASL. Uh, two, uh, one just finished, and uh, we, I just restarted with that partner, and another one going ongoing with another partner. And as well, I've just started with uh, uh, an, a local opponent. We're playing Vassal PBEM as well because we wanted to take a... Uh, take a run at a small campaign game from um, Lone Canuck Publishing, the Hell's Highway campaign game. They're, they're smaller campaign games. It's sort of a, a bit of a warm-up before we maybe take a, take a shot at uh, one of the big ones like Red Barricades or something like that. Uh, this is a, an opponent that I uh, used to play with uh, regularly at the old uh, Calgary ASL club back in the 90s. And uh, he's still still playing and still uh, a big member of that club, so it's great to reconnect with him. Um, as well, I'm still playing uh, Unhappy King Charles. I'm still playing Nemesis Burma 1944. My Bayonet and Tomahawks game finished. It was, uh, it was scenario three. It was fantastic. Went down to the last two activations of the final turn. Uh, as the French, I was in the lead, but the, in the scenario three, uh, the British, they just keep coming and coming and coming. And in the second last uh, activation, my uh, British opponent managed to um, take the lead on points. And in the final activation, I, uh, I had a shot at retaking uh, Quebec. But uh, I failed, so I lost by one point. But what a what a great game! It worked really well by uh, playing by PBEM, and um, I, I look forward to playing the full campaign game next. We're taking a little break, but I'm sure we'll come back to it and play that one again. Um, also, still playing Imperial Struggle. Um, yeah, I still I still like that one. It's, it's still uh, it's always like oh my gosh, I got to get my head around this before I sit down to do a turn. Uh, Corregidor, Return to the Rock, and uh, a new game of Stalingrad, Verdun on the Volga, both Mike Ranella games. Love both of those. And uh, also have an ongoing uh, game of uh, Undaunted Normandy. We got to, got finished one sin and got on to the next one, and uh, I think we'll just keep uh, uh, you know tricking along there until we get through most of the box. And uh, finally, uh, yeah, still have an a ongoing game of uh, Combat Commander Europe, and uh, really love that. So yeah, a big uh, a big slate of games on uh, the Vassal PBEM front, um, but uh, for the most part they go uh, well. Some go quicker than others, but uh, for most of them I can get a turnout a day or a turnout uh, every two or three days if uh, if they're slightly more complex. I've had a few games come in. Uh, I haven't got these uh, played yet, but uh, I look forward to them. Um, I got uh, from MMP. I got. Uh, Angola on their recent sale. I've uh, th that's been a kind of a grail game for me. I really look forward to playing that, even though it's a four-player game and it's going to be tough for me to uh, to wrangle a game of that. Uh, I can't wait to play it. It's it's uh, a unique game and uh, I think it's inspired a few other games. So I I can't wait to play it. I got a used copy of Pax Pamir, the second edition, the new edition. Uh, I look forward to that. Uh, 
the update kit for uh, Hannibal and Hamilcar, which was, uh, I think, originally just uh, Hannibal, you know, the original game, Mark Simonich's uh, original uh, CDG. It was, I think, it was just Ham- Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage, or something like that. But they've they've added in the uh, the extra game Hamilcar, uh, and that's from Phalanx, and uh, they. I think they've redone the rules and uh, redone a few charts or a few things. So um, I got the update kit for that. I haven't even opened it yet. So we'll uh, I'll probably do an unboxing for that just to see what's in there. Um, the Last Hundred Yards, Volume 3, the Solomons uh, campaign. Uh, I'm w- with a buddy. We're working through uh, some of the scenarios from the Airborne box at the moment. So that'll be a bit before I get to that. And I've uh, I got a couple other that have come in, but I haven't broken the shrink yet. So I'll I'll leave uh, I'll leave mentioning those until I actually have a look in the box. Um, also, uh, if you're like me, you've uh, there seems to have been a whack of charges from uh, P500s or uh, or comparable from uh, GMT lately. So uh, charged and soon to arrive to me are Mark Herman's Pacific War and Mark Simonich's Salerno. Uh, 43 both from GMT and then a new printing of Hollow Legions from MMP uh, two of those three are real doorstoppers so uh, I'm I'm pretty sure the delivery drivers are going to hate me okay let's talk about returning to ASL after uh, a 20 year gap I, uh, I played this game extensively from 1985 to 2000 uh, I owned almost everything available, all the core modules, the smaller expansions, all the annuals, the uh, historical ASL sets, and, and as much uh, third-party stuff as I could find. Kinetic Energy, Heat of Battle. Um, I, had, I had folks uh, send me photocopies of ASL UG and route reports that I, I wasn't able to get up here in Canada. Uh, even a smattering of critical hit stuff. Uh, that's, that sort of uh, completism isn't really possible anymore. There's just such a torrent of product anymore. I, I'm trying some new things. Uh, you know, now that we're now that I've come back to the game, I've some stuff from uh, Lone Canuck, uh, dispatches from the bunker, uh, even from France. I've got a a, a campaign game from uh, Le Franc Terreur. So uh, yeah, I'm still uh, I'm still bitten by the uh, collectability of the whole thing. Uh, a brief side note. Uh, I was surprised to see uh, when I was uh, kind of having a look at what's uh, still available and out at the friendly local game store, uh, I was surprised to see uh, Critical Hit is still around. I remember back in the 90s when the uh, when the third party st- stuff started to appear, um, there was a bit of a, a copyright tussle between... Uh, well, I can't remember if it was AS or if I can't remember if it was Avalon Hill or MMP at the time, but uh, whoever was the rights holder and uh, the third party um, producers, um, ASL was threatening to shut them down for copyright infringement, and it caused a lot of uh, a lot of folks to change the layouts of the scenario cards and things like that. But I remember, I remember Critical Hit going one step farther, and actually, if I recall correctly. They designed their game, uh, Advanced to Brook System, ATS. Uh, they designed that game uh, as a way to have a game that they could use the ASL components that they were creating with their own system. So, so they could put out a module and say, hey, this is for ATS. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, if you want, it's also compatible with uh, ASL. And of course, everybody was buying it for ASL. Um, but uh, yeah. It, uh, the tricky thing about Critical Hit is I, I always remember their uh, they didn't have the best record for um, quality control or uh, scenario playtesting and whatnot, as I recall. At least that was my impression of them. So I'm uh, I was somewhat surprised to see they're still alive and kicking, and even more surprised to see that uh, some folks actually play ATS and enjoy it. So uh, you know, um, more power to you. Hats off. I'm glad uh, I'm glad that all worked out. It. Uh, it's not what I. Uh, it's not the way I thought it uh, would work out. But uh, you know, if people are happy, have at it. Um, back back in the day, uh, I was part of the uh, Genie ASL group, which then morphed into the Usenet ASL mailing list, and that's where I first ran into guys like Brian Yous and Perry Cock, as well as Tom Rapetti, Dan Dolan, Rodney Kidney, Kinney, uh, the designer of uh, the original VASL. Um, 
not household names, but for ASLers and particularly older ones, they'll probably ring a bell. Uh, we used to play a lot of um, PBEM back then as well, but you had to leave the game set up on your table. There was no VASL back then. So you uh, left the game set up on your table and you emailed phases back and forth, uh, all on the honor system. I, uh, I found a, a rack that was, I think it was for holding drafting drawings, and it had six removable sort of slide-out shelves that could be pulled completely out. So each one of them would hold a game as long as it wasn't more than uh, three maps. So um, I had a lot of uh, ASL, PBEM going e even back in the uh, On Your Honor Hex Encounter days, or uh, yeah, live uh, non-virtual days the uh, act on the actual board. I've been uh, I've been doing the PBEM thing a long time. So, uh, what's uh, what strikes me as new after 20 years of not really paying attention to the game? Uh, probably th the first thing is uh, the rule book. Uh, number one, finally, an e a s l r b uh, uh, an, uh, an electronic uh, a PDF version. Uh, I remember my old uh, my old ASLRB was filled with pencil notations, uh, Q and A references. Uh, it was uh, it was it was just like uh, you know uh, stuff that I printed out on the computer and pasted in, and it was just a, it was just a giant uh, uh, mass of a thing. This is so much better. It's uh, so much lighter, uh, and the ability. I mean, ASL's got a fantastic index, the best index of any war game I know. But even with that, it's so great to be able to use the uh, PDF version and and just do a search for a certain term in a in you know when you're in a certain part of the rulebook. It's just so quick to find what you want. Um, that said, it's uh, I do have a new version of the paper rulebook, and it's interesting. The rules themselves look a little. Um, I don't know how else to say it. They, they look a bit fatter. It's uh, I'm not talking about uh, the typeface or the font or whatever. It's just that I look at certain paragraphs and it's like something that used to be four sentences now is six. And some things that were six are now ten. It's just a visual thing, but that's how it looks. Some paragraphs look uh, sort of beefier than I remember. I recall it as a bit leaner uh, comparatively. I mean, <laughs> this is ASL. It's nothing is... <laughs> very uh, lean. <laughs> but I guess that's just the, the, cons the cost of constant clarification, the cost of uh, constant updating and, and making things as clear as possible means that uh, you, you just need a few more words. The rule book is certainly intimidating. I, I get it. Uh, ASL continues to be a game that's easiest to learn from a veteran player rather than trying to pick it up all on your own. Uh, I, I still feel like the the basics of the game are very simple, but the the wealth of details is mountainous and uh, and intimidating. I get it. Uh, also new, uh, completely new, is the map boards. Uh, gone are all the old mounted maps, and the new ones are just on a on a more uh, a heavier cardboard sort of. I, I like the new ones. They're they're much lighter to haul to the club once we uh, can play face to face again, and. Um, Without having those uh, curved edges and the paper printed on a hard backing, uh, they, they line up better as well. They're more truly geomorphic. Uh, yeah, the new maps are uh, are great. Plus, there's a there's a, if you uh, bought a lot of those uh, action packs, I've gone back and picked up as many as I could find. There's the new style of maps as well, as long as the, as well as the long uh, the long thin ones that we're used to from ASL. There's the the ones that are sort of uh, more short and fat. Instead of uh, folding lengthwise, they fold widthwise. Uh, so I guess some people call them the Gary Fortenberry maps. Anyway, that's uh, that's kind of cool. Really like them. Um, I also noticed that uh, looking at the the uh, average scenarios that are uh, published now, in uh, particularly in the uh, the journals, not the annuals anymore, they seem uh, smaller. Uh, shorter, more tournament-sized. Uh, certainly, there's um, uh, third-party people like uh, Bounding Fire Productions. They their stuff looks like they still put out uh, monster-sized scenarios. But the scents that come in the journal, or uh, or uh, you know, I have a few packs from um, 
uh, Lone Canuck or uh, Dispatches from the Trenches or whatever they're called. Um, they, they all look uh, they all look a little the the more recent ones all look uh, shorter and a lot of stuff that's uh, six seven turns instead of those uh, big uh, 11 12 turn things that uh, that I remember from back in the day. Uh, speaking of scenarios, there's got to be thousands of them out there now. Between the stuff that comes in the modules and the journals and the action packs, there's a, there's just like a ton of official stuff, and then five times more in third party product. It's it's incredible. About the uh, the only thing that I haven't been impressed with maybe is the winter offensive packs from MMP, where you get uh, two or three scenarios and a map board. And given that each one has a map board, it feels like they're a must buy for something that I might otherwise uh, you know pass up, but. Kind of got to have uh, all the maps if you can possibly swing it. Um, the number of ASL dedicated websites has ballooned as well. It's just, uh, you, you know, you if you want to just go down the rabbit hole of reading, um, reading good ASL content on the web or, or watching ASL videos, there's no shortage. The, uh, the ASL forums at gamesquad.com seems to be the main watering hole for ASLers. But I really like the uh, aslscenarioarchive.com website. It's a, a great way to search for the exact scenario you want to play. It, it's got a giant database of every scenario that they can get their hands on. And you can search uh, for scenarios using your favorite boards or nationalities or by specific AFVs. Or, uh, I mean, there's just a, 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 there's probably two dozen different um, parameters you can, uh, fields that you can uh, specify when you're making a search. Uh, they also have a thing where you can, uh, uh, indicate which modules or which uh, third-party products you have so you can search just for scenarios that are within your own collection as well, which uh, narrows things down nicely. And it also has a, uh, they have a sort of a, a scenario uh, record. Now there, there used to be a, well, there still is. There's a, there was Roar back in the day. That even, that started way back in the nineties. The remote online automated record where uh, every time you played a scenario, you could put the results in and it gives a nice, uh, a nice indication of scenario balance. Um, uh, ASLScenarioArchive.com has a similar thing and, uh, and it looks very promising. The only, tricky part there is um, aslscenarioarchive.com they don't log whether the balance provisions have been used so I think um, I think Roar is still the better place to check for scenario balance but uh, I do enter my results in both and I live in hope that the uh, ASL Scenario Archive guys will see fit to add uh, a place to put in whether you used uh, balance provisions or not when you enter a, a scenario result Vassal V-A-S-L. I mean, wow. Um, Non-ASLers may not know that uh, V-A-S-S-A-L started out as V-A-S-L. Now uh, V-A-S-L is basically just a module for the bigger V-A-S-S-A-L project. But uh, I got to say, there's no better Vassal module than the ASL Vassal module. Uh, given it's all, all that it has to do with the game is complex and varied as ASL, it, it's amazing it keeps up, but it keeps up and more. It's a, it's a fantastic module and, uh, uh, you know, like all of uh, Vassal has uh, opened up gameplay for all. I'm uh, so grateful for Rodney Kinney for uh, designing that originally and uh, for the people who um, who managed to keep it going. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an all-volunteer thing. So uh, hats off to those guys. That's fantastic. In terms of gameplay... Um, it took me a few games to get myself back up to speed, of course, and uh, there's still plenty to relearn. Um, but I, uh, I, I've, I've played quite a few games now in the last year, and I've finally got a few wins under my belt. Um, no night rules or gliders or caves or beach landings or anything like that yet. But I've got the basics of infantry play back, and I'm almost feeling good about AFVs. Uh, I'm definitely losing more AFVs than, uh, than I'm killing, but uh, what the hell. Um, what I notice about my new, my few new current opponents, as opposed to the many I had back in the 90s, may indicate a little evolution in gameplay. I'm not sure, or, or maybe it's just the way these guys play, but uh, I'm seeing um, more board edge creep by the attackers. Uh, I'm seeing way more willingness to take low odds shots, more bounding fire, intensifier, guns, duels, things like that. 
I'm seeing more willingness to drive AFVs and half tracks right into the infantry if there's no Panzerfaust or other ATP or uh, anti tank gun weapons around. And finally, even with the low odds shots, I'm seeing more maneuver and less prep fire, uh, which is encouraging. Um, many of the newer tactical games use larger hexes in the the maps, so with because the hexes are so big, the maps feel actually smaller and restrictive. I love that ASL has uh, old school sized hexes and plenty of room to move. In terms of what I see less of, um, the IIFT, the incremental infantry fire table, seems to be a, a forgotten relic of an earlier time. It was uh, it was still a, a hot topic back in the '90s, the late '90s. Whether uh, every time you sat down to play somebody, there would be a, a the scenario would start with a discussion of. Uh, which infantry, t- which fire table you were going to use, but uh, I haven't met anybody recently who still wants to use the IIFT. Uh, stacking is almost non-existent with the folks I'm playing with now. Not, it wasn't really prevalent before, but there were. I remember a few guys that liked to to build those big, uh, giant kill stacks and uh, and try and bash their way through that way. I'm, I'm seeing none of that for sure. Um, rules arguments are gone. Uh, I guess that's probably no doubt due to 35 years of clarifications of the rule book and the Perry says rulings, but uh, uh, not that there was a ton of that back in the day, but um, it seems like things are looked up quickly and easily and uh, with no disagreement. So uh, yeah, that's, those are the things that I, uh, those are the things that I don't miss and, uh, or that I've noticed are gone. I've played a lot uh, in the, in the 20 years since I, quit ASL and before I picked it up again, I played a lot of World War II tactical systems in the meantime. I've played uh, Band of Brothers, Conflict of Heroes, Tide of Iron, Last Hundred Yards, Combat Commander, Fighting Formations. Um, uh, I've enjoyed most of them, happily play all of them again, but uh, ASL is still my sweet spot. I I really love that it, it takes on everything. Um, one of the things that sort of limits my interest in so many of the newer systems is how the core game focuses on a division or a single campaign. Like, uh, you know, the, the last hundred yards uh, that I just got is going to be the Solomon's campaign or a band of brothers is, uh, you know, is, um, uh, focuses on a single division or even fighting formations is the, the gross Deutschland division. It's, uh, I don't know. I'd, I like the way, uh, ASL, uh, just gives you entire nationalities and the, uh, the entire range of the war to uh, to work with. Um, scenarios that can be set anytime, anywhere in terms of uh, all of World War II. So yeah, still my sweet spot. On to what's new. How about Caesar Rome versus Gaul by Mark Simonich from GMT Games? Uh, this is a fairly new game. I think uh, maybe it did it come out in 2020? Maybe 2020. I'm not sure if it was 20 or 21. Um, this uh, this is a well. Simonich designed what I what I think was the second ever uh, card driven game with his Hannibal Rome versus Carthage game. I think that was the 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 next CDG after the uh, the uh, We the People game that uh, was the um, CDG originator by Mark Herman. Um, anyway, I, yeah, I think Simonich designed the second ever one, the Hannibal one, and uh, this in many ways is a successor to the Hannibal game. Uh, it's qu- it's uh, quite similar. The, the Hannibal game is now with Phalanx. It's, uh, it's its third publisher, and it's been gussied up with uh, strange new dice and huge minis, so it's clearly a well-loved game. Uh, the Caesar game uh, builds upon that original game, and I think it improves it in some ways. The, the basic gameplay is very similar. Each player gets a hand of cards each turn, which he uses to move or attack with his, his leaders or his troops. On the Roman side, uh, you've got Caesar and two consuls and a bunch of legions. And for the Gauls, it's mostly tribes, uh, but the occasional leader pops up uh, or the occasional uh, mercenary. Each card played can be used either for the event, with the card text describing what's available for you to do, or for op points, although they're uh, they're called action points here, which you can use to um, uh, move, activate units, or uh, uh, plant your political control pieces, things like that. Uh, the map is a, a point-to-point map showing all of Gaul with Germania and Britannia abstracted in the upper northeast and northwest. And like many of the early siege 
CDGs, you uh, you spend much of the early game using your action points to place political control markers, uh, called influence markers here, and then you spend a bunch of the rest of the game trying to rest the, wrestle those spots away from each other. A battle has changed in this game. Um, in the uh, in the Hannibal game, it was a deck of battle cards, but here uh, instead it's a it's a dice based affair with a CRT. The twist here is that legions have a minimum they can roll. Their ones or twos become threes, making them a little more powerful. And each leader or tribal leader gets a number of rerolls. Uh, Caesar gets three rerolls. Most of the uh, Gaul tribes just get a single reroll. You can reroll one of your own dice or force your opponent to reroll one of his. Uh, the whole thing is uh, battle plays up much more quickly than the original battle deck and works much better for uh, vassal PBEM. So uh, that really works well for me. The other completely new thing... Um, is how uh, the Gauls arrive on the map. Uh, Caesar and his legions, uh, they they basically stay on the map wherever you leave them from turn to turn. But uh, for the Gauls, each turn, three new chits are drawn at random from uh, an opaque cup or a, a bag. And those chits represent three new tribes that are placed on the map in uh, whatever their little home area is. Or they can be held off board for later if you wish. So uh, each turn, the Gaul gets three more tribes. And uh, the the Roman has been trying to eliminate the tribes uh, as fast as they pop up. It's, it's a bit of a whack-a-mole game. But the cool thing is uh, with this uh, random, uh, random arrival of these uh, Gauls, no two games will be alike as you never know where the Gaul uprisings will be. Uh, as well, tribes, uh, when they fight with the legions, they're not always eliminated in combat. They can be, and then the uh, the Roman gets uh, victory points for that. But sometimes they're, the Roman uh, force is so powerful that instead of eliminating them, they merely subjugate them. And so the, uh, the Gaul pieces are removed and put in this uh, subjugation holding box, uh, usually losing a step of their power. The, their most units in the game are two-step units. The Gaul player can then use a turn somewhere later in the game to bring back all the subjugated units from that box and put them on the map in their home in their home areas. They'll they'll be weak, but they'll still be a, a, a big nuisance for Caesar to deal with. And another thing that makes the game uh, completely uh, completely different from uh, play to play. Victory in this game is dependent on how well Caesar does. He amasses uh, victory points each year for six years, scoring at year end for how much of Gaul is under his control. And uh, there's a bit, of, there's a variable, whether he has a presence in an area or he controls the area, he gets a, a different level of uh, VP for each of the areas. And then he gets VP as well for a, a few side projects, such as the, uh, the aforementioned Britannia and Germania. Um, Early comments on the game had a few people complaining that Caesar couldn't win. Um, I think those cries have died down now. I, I hope it isn't the case. It does feel like the game comes down to sort of a single point differential between Caesar winning and losing, uh, at least in my place so far, and uh, a lot that I've seen reported. And uh, uh, I don't know. Here's hoping it turns out to be balanced, as, as this game is great fun to play. The map is easy to read. It's good to look at. The pieces are sturdy. There's none of the unnecessary minis. It's a typical uh, A-plus GMT production. I really like it. Uh, it does have a, a vassal module. It's perfectly usable. usable. Um, I'd say it lacks a few features. Uh, firstly, of course, there's no notes widget. This should be standard on any module where the players play via play by email, but uh, some designers, uh, I don't know, some designers just sort of forget about PBEMers. They think everybody plays Vassal Live. Uh, I wish they'd uh, I wish they'd broaden their horizons a little bit. Also, uh, there's no way to note when Caesar has been delayed. That's a, a, game, uh, a game mechanism. It can only happen once per game, but on each of the six turns, the, uh, the Roman player has to roll and see if Caesar uh, uh, appears on the very first impulse or if he has to wait. Uh, and once he once he's delayed and has to wait once, then you don't have to roll for it anymore for the rest of the game. But there's there's no place to note this, and it's a hard thing to remember this sort of thing uh, over PBM. It would it would be nice if there was a just a little checkbox or you know even the even the notes widget would help with this. Uh, worst of all, I suppose um, with this module is uh, nothing. 
Well, the, all the names are on the map. All the all the areas are named properly on the map, but the uh, the logging doesn't pick up the names from the map. So the whatever the, whatever the designer has used for the uh, the map tiles, he's he's written the name there, but he hasn't actually named the areas on the map. So when you when you move a, a unit on the map, it just says uh, unit A moves from main map to main map. It doesn't say moves from uh, you know this place to that place it's 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 it makes it difficult to see where the action is sometimes uh you, you got to really make sure that you've got your preferences set where uh, where the screen follows your opponent's moves uh but it, it would just be much more uh helpful if uh, the uh, designer had taken the time to make the logging uh, more robust. Again, that's a, a thing that's really helpful for uh, PBEMers, uh, and uh, perhaps it was just uh, forgotten about. Um, also, um, the leaders and the units there in the in the uh, in the way the module's been designed, they're of a different unit type than the control markers. So that means that if you have a a control marker on a space with a bunch of units on top of it. If you hover your mouse over that stack, you'll get to see all the units, but you won't get to see the control marker on the bottom. And you'll have to pull the units off manually to see who uh, who controls the space. It's a it's a small thing, but it gets very annoying over the course of a game. It would be a, even if there was a button. Um, I've seen this in many modules where you you can uh, the hit a button on the task bar and or the menu bar and either remove all the pieces or just remove the units and leave the control markers that would be so helpful in this game uh, finally uh, the other thing that's a little um i don't know a bit of a letdown in this game is the the cards uh, in in the in the physical game the cards are sort of huge they're big like tarot cards and the vassal module replicates that i, I suppose they have to they had to uh, scan them or or use the uh, the original files for them but um they're so big and you have to draw them manually from the deck into uh, you have a, a pop up window for your hand but there's no snap to grid feature. There's no button that automatically draws the card to your hand. So you're you're dragging and dropping these cards, and uh, I I've got a pretty big screen, but it doesn't. I don't seem to be able to open both my uh, the screen for my hand and the screen for the deck without making them overlap. So when I'm drawing my hand, it's oh, my hand's just always a mess. It's uh, there's a lot more elegant ways to do the dealing of cards and the arrangement of cards in Vassal. Um, uh, look, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the module. Uh, I appreciate that uh, all module design is uh, is done uh, for free, and uh, and I and I really appreciate it. But the this this module just doesn't measure up to modules for similar games. Um, it's uh, version 1.1. I, I hope it continues to be developed and improved because uh, the game really deserves uh, uh, an A plus module as well. Okay, time for a little uh, tip of the cat, uh, tip of the tip of the cap, I should say. Um, I'd like to uh, tip my cap uh, this episode to War Diary magazine. Uh, I've subscribed to this for a couple of years now. It's a great magazine. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a mix of historical articles with game tie-ins, game reviews, and you know, general wargaming chatter. Um, uh, I really like it. Uh, I've I've found the price for it to be uh, decent as it is, but they've adjusted their prices, um, and I think they've their price for Canada and USA is is still great. It's a it might even be slightly reduced. I think it's thirty two dollars US per year. Uh, and look, I, I also I just have to say big shout out to these guys for including us Canadians in your US pricing because. Uh, you're the only su subscription I have where I don't pay extra to get it across the border. So I, I love that. Um, anyway, uh, $32 per year per the for US dollars per year for the paper mailed version. But uh, anyone can choose between the paper or the PDF subscriptions. And a digital subscription is only $16. So I, I think those the PDF version is going to be a big boon to overseas subscribers because uh, you know, the, I think uh, the... 
the price for overseas is close to 50 bucks. So suddenly being able to get the game for uh, 16 or $16 to get the PDF. Um, it, they don't, it's not like they, ha- they never have an included game or anything like that, but it's, I think I've only seen it, seen an included uh, game type uh, insert in maybe one in six or eight issues. So, so, uh, you know, a, a digital su- subscription, you're, you're really not losing anything. The, the whole, the whole magazine seems to be run by seasoned gamers who've been around the block. I, I really enjoy it. So, uh, hats off to War Diary magazine. Check it out. Finally, before we go, uh, editorial time. Uh, this uh, this month, I want to talk about blocks. I love them. I love blocks, block games. I love uh, double-sided commands and colors style blocks, single-sided Rommel in the Desert style, or uh, even Academy Games style with no sticker, the little small cubes for games like 1812, 1775, 1754. Uh, I like them all. There, there's just something satisfying about the tactile feeling of painted wooden blocks with or without stickers. Uh, given the choice between blocks and minis, it's, it's no contest for me. Blocks feel better in my hand. They don't break. Uh, you don't need to paint them. They're easier to store and, and they make the games less expensive. Uh, I guess maybe for some players, the appeal of minis is they help them feel more immersed in the game, but uh, I have no such feeling. In fact, I wish the commands and colors blocks use symbols or something rather than the indistinguishable little drawings on their stickers. I'm, I'm plenty immersed in gameplay if it's a good game. I, uh, I, I don't need the little figurines for sure. Uh, I get that blocks aren't, aren't a good fit for every game, particularly the single-sided ones that are meant to increase fog of war. I'm not sure they make sense in a, a big strategic World War II game, for example, where they may keep you from knowing if the unit in the next hex from you is your enemy's infantry or his armor. I think, um, you know, when we're talking about divisions or armies, we'd, we'd kind of know. But, but for games like, uh, say, Hammer of the Scots or things like that, where everything is infantry, I, I think the Fog of War blocks work great. Um, a while ago, I, I was listening to a podcast and I heard the head honcho from Academy Games saying folks preferred minis to cubes and that the cubes lovers were just a, a very vocal minority. The silent majority prefers minis was his inference. Wow, uh, that's a, a Nixon-esque phrase if ever there was one meant to discount those of us who like Academy's games, but not their move away from cubes. I have no idea if I'm in the minority or majority on this, but like just... Count me as a vocal uh, supporter in my love of blocks. Well, um, thanks for listening once again. You can look for us uh, on the web at pushingcardware.com where you can uh, comment on anything you hear here or at Cardboard Pusher on Twitter. Uh, if you enjoyed it, give us a rating on your local podcast app and uh, tell a buddy about us. Uh, in the meantime, uh, happy gaming. Talk to you next time.